ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the ADC podcast where I have Lachlan Ramsey from Walker Hill. Um, he is an accountant. I've known him for a, a good three years now. Welcome, Lachlan. How are you doing, mate? Cheers. Cheers, Andrew. Good stuff. Good Thanks for coming along. Um, I thought I'd invite you along to, to really kind of dig deep around how does accounting work within the context of small business owners? Because there's a lot of small business owners out there who are absolutely struggling. Right. And, and I thought I'd bring in an expert to kind of show them the way, show them the light so that they can put themselves in the, in the best foot um, so that they can actually achieve their goals a hell of a lot faster. So my question to you, mate, is for the aspiring business owners out there, how would you go about, well, what are the options to establish kind of different kind of entities to, to put them in, a, in the best position to win financially? Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I suppose to, to start a business, you obviously need some sort of vehicle uh, to run it. Um, it. It varies based on, you know, the the size of the business or, or even your own aspirations um, as to what you want to build the business up to be, uh, the type of work you're doing, um, whether you're hiring people or not, and uh, I suppose whether you're buying a, um, a considerable amount of assets. Um, all of those factors play into, you know, a, a type of entity uh, as to which you want to start your business in, right? So the first one would just be a, a sole trader, right? So your sole traders are more hobbyists, I suppose, um, but are making good coin, um, or then they don't have a team behind them and they're just earning income off, off their own bat. Um, and, you know, sole trader, that will just be completely fine for those guys. Um, when I say sole trader, you know, a few people out there might also be familiar with the term uh, just getting an ABN. Yeah, it's probably sums up sole traders pretty well. Uh, your second option then is, uh, I suppose, a company, um, which would be for legitimate business owners who are, are willing to go um, really deep and put their full heart and soul and effort into what they're trying to do, the business they're trying to run. Company's probably your way to go. Uh, provide you with certain tax benefits, asset protection, and, um, you know, it, it, it presents better to the market as well uh, when you operate as a company who's, you know, registered for GST, um, have your website, your proprietary limited, maybe even a business name on there, um, which I think a lot of people probably forget about sometimes as well, right? Because it's nothing wrong with being a sole trader, but if you're willing to, if you're looking to grow your business long term, um, you know, like, like why not start, start off the bat? Um, you know, in your company structure and, and build it up from there. Um, you know, which isn't which isn't technical at all. That's just that's just you know presenting yourself to the market. And then I suppose your third option would be would be um, a, trust, a trust or a partnership. Um, they are too, I suppose, complex and um, uh, different options that small business owners have as well. I throw them into the same bracket because trusts and partnerships can't retain income. Um, it's actually pretty hard to, um, uh, ooh, what's the word? I suppose, yeah, trusts and partnerships, like they, they can't retain, they can't retain income, right? So um, what I mean by that is every dollar that your trust earns, a dollar has to come out and be taxed somewhere else. Um, you can definitely build a business up inside of a trust or a partnership, but I suppose who actually owns the assets at the end of the day, um, I suppose comes into questions and can get a bit uh, hairy or uh, confusing. Hopefully, yeah. by the way, I described that <laughs> turns people off it. <laughs> well, that's it. I mean, it's, it's obviously you'd want to go down the path of the company company pathway based off of that that conversation that we of that topic that you just yeah. mentioned. Now, sort of step back. Like about shareholders, like so, so at, like, as a company owner, what are the options for for the shareholders or the owners of of that company? Yeah, so so a trust can be a shareholder as well, which is another legal entity, and then I suppose it can also be owned by another company, um, which we would refer to as a maybe like an ultimate holding company, and then um, and then individuals as well. So I suppose best example is. Um, you know, an individual goes and buys a share a share portfolio on the um, on the ASX. They have a piece of pie of that company, um, and and the dividends or the profits that get paid out of that ASX company uh, is received by that individual, and that's you know then taxed in their own name. Um, 
you can do the exact same thing with uh, smaller proprietary limited companies. So um, if I start my company in accounting tomorrow um, and I own my, um, own my company in, in my own name as an individual, um, then I suppose the profits that the company pays out will just you know hit hit my you know Lachlan's personal taxable personal tax return um, uh, in its own. Right? So that causes challenges um, when when your company really starts to get off the ground um, and running, and there's a lot of retained earnings building up in that entity um, because. I suppose the secret and the art to accounting and tax is, is, is capping your tax rate, right? So companies have a fixed tax rate of 25% uh, if you're running a small business. And then um, individuals at a marginal tax rate level can be anywhere between zero to 47%. So if I own my own, if I own my company as an individual, um, I've got to kind of play the balancing act as in every dollar that comes out of my company is going to hit my hit my name or my tax return, you know, the, the, the faster those retained earnings are paid out, the higher my tax rate's going to be. Um, and it's got nowhere else to go because I'm the only shareholder of that company, right? Um, if you had two shareholders of, of one company, um, it's going to go out uh, to those two, I suppose, equally, just um, as a high level example, a basic example. Um, but, but again, I suppose the way well, depending on how fast the retained earnings are coming out, the, the profits have got nowhere else to go other than those two individuals, right? Um, which leads us to, yeah, the, the other option of, of holding your shares of your company within a, um, a family trust um, or some other, type, some other trust structure. Um, what the trust allows you to do, um, allows you to split and diversify your income effectively, right? So it's not fixed. So uh, the opposite or the flip side to what I was explaining about before with your individuals owning uh, the shares of, of the company, if your trust owns the shares of the companies, um, the shares of the company, the retained earnings will come out. It's gonna hit your trust structure and the trust in each and every single individual financial year can choose where it's gonna distribute its income. Right, so best example is again myself. Let's say I own a company, I've got myself a trust, and I've um, got a partner, Louise. Uh, Louise and I had a baby about uh, 12 months ago, and so she's obviously gone on to maternity leave during that time. Right, so her income is a lot lower than mine's going to be, right? So if I had a, if I had a company and a trust in, in that financial year, I would be declaring a dividend out of my company, it's hitting my trust. It's just then distributing to to my spouse who's on a much lower tax bracket than myself. Right? Let's say then Louise goes back into uh, the workforce. She earns more than me, um, which is good at what she does. And then um, you know the the next financial year, the company would declare the dividend, hit the trust, doesn't have to go to Louise in that year. You know, I'd then distribute that that to myself, or we find a balance between between the two individuals. That's awesome. So you get that flexibility to really choose where the money flows to lower that marginal tax rate or or the tax payable on on the distribution, right? And that, so, that's really so, powerful. Yeah, and so trusts trusts don't actually do a lot, I suppose, in in um, in the day to day operations and running running of your business, but they are absolutely the most important aspect of your business structure. Um, it allows it opens up so much flexibility and yet yeah, capping your tax rate, um, building wealth. Um, and you know, gives you options into into like really long term in terms of um, selling your business or um, bringing on other business partners, um, you know, and stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. And so you mentioned a holding company earlier as well. So you could theoretically have a trust owning the holding company outright, and then the holding company owning multiple other companies as well, right? So this is how kind of yeah. So now yeah. So so we're definitely still talking about smaller. Um, we're, we're definitely talking about smaller, be small to medium businesses still, but um, probably on the higher range of that, um, where we're talking about uh, an ultimate holding company that that is the ultimate shareholder of maybe like uh, two or three or four different companies, right? Um, the benefit to that is 
if you um, if you have multiple business partners, for example, um, and you're all in those different business ventures together, and um, you're able to move money around that structure um, a lot more freely without fear of any top up tax consequences. Uh, because the, the second, I suppose, cash is paid out of that ultimate holding company and hits your trust, we're then talking about, I suppose, the tax consequences on, on an individual's marginal tax rate. Whereas cash moving from company A to holding company, holding company loaning money back to company B or company C, even company C and B helping out company A, all that cash is moving around in, in the same tax environment, um, which is really, I suppose, flexible and powerful in diverting your funds to where they need to be. Yeah, nice. Yeah, so, so the game is to obviously legally, right? That's that's the big word here, legally <laughs> reduce the taxes as best as possible because, hey, if you can save a dollar of taxes, you may as well pocket it so that you can reinvest. Because ultimately, the, the more you save, the more you can reinvest back into the business or back into a different asset class to build your yeah, portfolio. Absolutely, absolutely. So yeah, if it's like it's definitely achievable and possible to to cap a small business owners at, at a rate of 30%. Um, this disclaimer to that is depending on their lifestyle and whether they're, I suppose, willing to listen to advice. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, like like the, the highest marginal tax rate at 47% versus a rate of 30%, you know, we're talking 17 cents on the dollar. Um, you know, yeah, that, as you said before, you put back in your own pocket and use as, use as you need. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Absolutely. Now, I, I saw I saw a talk of yours a couple of weeks back, and you mentioned multiple accounts for business owners to help out with GST, uh, payroll tax, some a bit of budgeting, that kind of thing. Can you walk us through what would be the ideal kind of starting point for small business out small businesses out there who are struggling to kind of keep up with their numbers? And yeah. if you can give them a bit of a framework to just make it a little bit easier for them, what, what would the yeah. what would the accounts look like? Absolutely, yeah. So I suppose that the, the concept behind that is um, the the business bank account is is not your not your bank account. Unfortunately, I hate to say that line. I hate to say it, um, but yeah, it's, it's true. It's not your it's not your bank account, right? So if you're if you're running your business out of your company, um, what you see there is actually includes your your income tax money, which you have not yet paid to the ATO. It includes GST that you've collected on behalf of the ATO. Um, it includes superannuation that you owe to your employees. So by having just the one bank account, um, you looking at that number, you might think you have $300,000, where in reality, your profit might only be something like you know, 50 or 70 or 100, right? Just pulling numbers out of thin air. So how, how you can change the mindset and, and structure your finances as a small business owner is uh, potentially getting three, three different accounts. Your first account is just going to be your your day to day operations, income in and expenses out. Um, so yeah, your operational account. Account number two would be like a GST uh, provisioning account, um, and you'd also provision for your employee superannuation and withholding tax in that one as well. So this is really easy for me to say, and um, I suppose hard to implement into practice. But for every dollar that comes into your business almost 10%, um, you know, every 10 cents on the dollar that comes into your business's income should be going to that GST account, right? Because when it comes to town for your monthly and quarterly bats, you're going to have the cash there to just, you know, knock it out and pay it. Um, you've also moved that money out of your, out of your operational account into that second account. So immediately at a high level, you're looking at the balances and you know what you owe to the ATO. Um, so why I say that's easy to me to say and hard to put into practice is that you're obviously like, I suppose, incurring GST as you're spending money on your overheads as well. Um, which means that if you are able to do um, or follow that advice of the 10 cents on the dollar, you're always going to be over provisioning for your buzzers um, and you'll never be, you'll never be caught behind. And then in addition to that account, every, every pay run that you would, or every two pay runs that you would make to your employees, um, your accounting software should tell you what the POIG withholding and superannuation liabilities are associated with that pay run. Um, you know, after you pay your employees, pay that second bank account, start building up the tax provisions in there, 
again, just so it's out of your working capital account and, and you're not spending um, your employees' money or the taxman's money. So that's bank account one and two. Bank account number three is uh, sort of income tax, right? So if you're running your business out of, your, out of a company, um, you're going to pay no more than 25%. You're going to pay no less. So every week, uh, fortnight, month, run yourself a profit and loss. See how much you've uh, uh, um, see how much you've derived or gained in that in that period, and twenty five percent of your profit into that account. And then in saying that, um, you know, if you've made a loss for that period um, for whatever reason, you know, twenty five percent on your loss, take that money out of your income tax and put it back into your your working capital. Yeah. And so, so just to kind of quickly summarize, you've got 25% for income tax, you've got 10% for GST, obviously provisioning for a little bit more than what's necessary so that you never get caught, which is a massive risk for a lot of business owners, business mm-hmm. owners out there. I'm sure you would have seen a lot of horror stories where business owners go, what? Yeah, the Why do I pay this? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, the ACO is pretty aggressive off. at the moment as well, so you may not want to be behind with them at the moment. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And you've got payroll, superannuation. And then so so in terms of, I guess, the, the profit that you want to take out, let's talk about that. Like, I, I guess as a business owner, what, what should business owners do? Is it is it depending on how ambitious they want they want to be? Because obviously profits can be reinvested back into the business or pulled out, put in their pocket, basically, mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. So, so, yeah, so there's, you- nothing, there's nothing stopping you, um, there's nothing stopping a fourth bank account coming into the fold um, you know, called, called your profits account, right? Um, and then, yeah, what what you do with it is is you know completely up to up to the business owner. So, reinvesting it back into the business or or paying yourself, right? Because I suppose at that at that fundamental level of of the three um, bank accounts, um, ideally the business owner. I suppose we can talk about how business owners can pay themselves as well. Like ideally, the business owner has come up with his own wage, right? Just because you're a business owner doesn't mean you don't have to pay yourself, right? You can still come up with a fixed amount to, to pay yourself consistently. Um, and so getting a profits account in the mix, um, you know, you, you would be running, you know, you'd be running some sort of accounts, you know, probably monthly or, or, or quarterly at that stage, um, figuring out the excess or available cash within your business after your, I suppose, um, three bank accounts that we just spoke about, all that excess cash can go into the profits account. Um, and, you know, and then you go you go visit your financial planner, your accountant um, or your mortgage broker and, and you, I suppose, explain to them that, you know, this is the available cash that I have in my business that I can do freely um, you know, and get some, get some advice from there and figure out what your, what your next steps are. Yeah, 100%. Now, now you, you mentioned getting paid. Like so, for these business owners, what are the what are the options that they have um, when it comes to paying themselves? Because obviously, there's, there's a few few changes in the rules recently, right? So, so I'd love to kind of hear more about about yeah. what the landscape looking like. At the moment. Yeah. So there's probably so there's probably two there's yeah two main methods, right? Um, in terms of uh, myself as your accountant can uh, can treat that for tax or deal with that for tax. Um, in in essence, um, the the day to day transferring of money um, out of your business to yourself, I suppose, doesn't change under each concept, right? Um, the only advice would be figure out what what your business is actually capable of paying yourself without compromising its working capital. Um, what's your lifestyle, and and what are your what are your goals there, and then just coming up with a fixed amount. Right, so not using your business bank account for every single transaction that you're doing, you know, on your weekend with your kids, family, mates, um, whatever you're doing, come up with an actual fixed payment, whether it's weekly, fortnightly, monthly, to yourself, and pay yourself properly. Keep your keep your your personal finances and your business finances separate. And then in terms of the technical ways of doing it, right, you've got you've got a formal salary and wage arrangement, which. Um, as, as myself working for, for Walker Hill as an employee, um, I'm paid fortnightly and and on my pay, I'm only receiving the net proceeds of, of my pay, right? So I'm paid 100 grand a year, um, for instance, or for example, and um, 
you know, 30 grand of that might go to the ATO and then I'm only receiving the 70,000 and you know, I don't even see that 30,000, right? The ATO is getting paid before myself. Um, so that's, that's definitely an option available for, for small business owners, which is a very structured method of, of paying themselves. Um, when, you, when you pay yourself under that arrangement, you're also accruing uh, superannuation um, at 10% or 10.5%, going up to 12% soon um, under that arrangement, which, which causes, I suppose, a cash flow um, issue because for a lot of startups, you know, superannuation just isn't a priority for them at that point in time, right? So, so the, the alternative method to, to that formal employee arrangement even though it's your own business, nothing's stopping you becoming an own, your own employee of your own business. The other, the other method is, is, a, is a dividends and drawings uh, model, right? Where, as I said before, when we started the, um, I suppose this topic, come up with your fixed amount based on what your business is doing, your lifestyle, those types of um, factors. However, you're just gonna transfer cash from your business bank account into your own account, right? You're not gonna be paying the ATO monthly or quarterly on your BAS for the for the withholding tax. Um, you're not gonna be incurring superannuation for um, yourself either, right? So what you would do over a, you know, a, a 12 month period is that you've come up with your fixed amount. At the end of the financial, or sorry, before the financial year, you're in a tax planning meeting with um, with your accountant, is that you've, you've got a loan effectively with your company, right? You've, you've taken money out of your business that that has not yet been declared as income in your personal tax return. So that is when during a tax planning meeting, so before the 30th of June, so you have time to make decisions and do stuff before that final cutoff date comes through um, as to what you decide to do with it in terms of like, you, you can repay that money back if you, if you decide to, which obviously probably isn't feasible if it's literally your wage that you're planning on spending every day. Um, Let's say if you were to take out a large sum at some point to go sit in like your offset account um, on your mortgage, pay less interest in the bank for a period of time, nothing stopping you paying that back. Um, you know, short-term loan from your company, or we or we decide on a dividend that um, the company is going to declare. Um, that dividend, as I suppose we spoke about um, first, uh, yeah, the, the dividend as, as we spoke about earlier. Was um, going to hit the shareholders of the company. So if it's your trust, for example, it's then going to be you know split, or the trust is going to distribute the income. You know what's depending on um, to get the best. You know, the dividends going to hit the trust. It's going to be distributed amongst the beneficiaries of the group just to get the best tax outcome. Hundred percent, and and that was cool. Like that that strategy that you shared there with parking the funds in the offset accounts. Quite a quite a. Uh, um, a good strategy for a lot of business owners who've got large lumps of cash sitting in their business account, earning them 0.1%. They could literally just park it in offset again. The current environment, you're earning four and a half, five percent on that per annum, which is pretty damn good, risk free, right? And then, then you move it back, and you can pay taxes within the company as well. I'm assuming, right? Yeah, you keep absolutely, the right? Because yeah, there's there's a certain, um, I suppose, art and science to 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 paying to paying your tax at the at the at the least or the last possible date that it's due, right? So there's nothing wrong with paying your tax on the due date. It's about it's about what do you do with the money between the time that you've actually collected it and the time that you're handing it over to um, to the government. Um, and so yeah, that's definitely one thing that you can do with it is move money around in for the short period of time that you have it to you know get that risk free return. Yeah, hundred percent. And 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 I guess obviously as an accountant, you run you run CFO services as well. So I'd like to kind of dig dig deep a little bit with those ones there because a lot of business owners are, are sort of they're, they're just hoping for the best. Let's be honest. Like they they don't particularly have data in front of them. They don't know what profitability looks like. They don't know, really know what's coming. They haven't forecasted. Those are the kinds of things that good CFOs do, right? So so what kind of what what would you recommend business owners? Who aren't quite ready to take on a CFO service, but who are teetering on the edge to get there? What do they need to do to just make sure they're on top of their numbers before they delegate out to someone like yourself? Yeah. So, so what the, the conversations that we're having during those CFO meetings is first and foremost, what's your business plan, right? Um, what what is your profitability and your margins look like? Um, the one of the one of the 
quickest and easiest calculations that um, a business owner should know who employs someone is your return on labor, right? So if, um, if you're generating $100,000 of sales and your employee um, costs, like so wages plus super, um, so it's plus payroll tax as well, if you're um, hitting that threshold, what, what's the total amount of those costs compared to, compared to your turnover, right? So if I've got 100 grand of sales, I'm paying 30 grand out to my employees, Every dollar that's coming into the bank account, thirty percent of it is is um, going to my going to my employees, right? So, so my return on labor is about um, you know, three, 30 cents on the dollar. Um, a lot of business owners just wouldn't even, you know, if you ask them what is their return on labor, you know, they just wouldn't even know. No, they probably haven't even thought about it. Um, you know, so you can do that exact same calculation with stuff like like advertising or marketing spend. Um, uh, definitely your direct costs if, if you're selling products, right? You've obviously got to import it or, you know, pay someone to, to supply it from somewhere. Um, so really figure out, I suppose, the margins that your business is making. Um, then have a decent idea, I suppose, what, what are your fixed costs, which is going to be insurance, um, your accounting and compliance fees, um, motor vehicle, <laughs> believe it or not, is a fixed cost. And that's actually becoming more relevant than ever, considering fuel is two, two bucks. Um, two bucks a litre, um, some pretty hefty insurance, sorry, motor vehicle expense accounts out there at the moment. Um, and then uh, what else we spoke about? I know, yeah, I suppose, yeah, they would be the main ones, right? There's, a, oh, I suppose rent, obviously, um, massive, um, I suppose, cash sucker out of the business, especially because it's fixed, right? So if you're not operating that rental premises at capacity, um, that's something else that is as a small business owner, you're probably really going to want to know, um, do I need the full 200 square meters or can I do with, with, you know, 150 square meters, right? Um, and for every one, you know, for every dollar or so, yeah, every dollar that's coming into my business, how much is going to the landlord? Um, and am I using that, that premises to its full capacity? So having a great understanding about those little things of your business, um, would go definitely a long way without getting someone like myself to, to assist. Um, so that's, that's, that's just, that's just all business plan, profitability and, and margin type of, um, you know, type of stuff first. And then we talk about, I suppose, what are the financials, what's your balance sheet looking like, um, specifically in terms of cash and, you know, after we figure out how much tax you owe, um, what is your available cash or are you actually in a cash deficit, right? Definitely, definitely happens. Um, you know, after your, after your provision for your taxes, you actually may be in a tax deficit, which just means that, that, that you're borrowing other people's money. Um, and if, and if that, if that, um, if that tax was due tomorrow, you actually don't have the cash to pay it. Right. Um, or if you did, then you're compromising on your working capital. Um, so yeah, those, those conversations, yeah, pretty much what we're running through in those TFO meetings. Yeah, that's it. And, and, and that highlights the, the importance of having those different accounts or at least conceptualizing those different accounts so you know what's coming it's important to have those buffers in place because man like you could you could get caught in a bind two or three months later you're going backwards and you're eating into your your net assets your your assets outside of the business to kind of keep funding the business that may mm. be a single chip right so so back to that example that you were sharing 100 grand worth of top line revenue 30 grand worth of expenses for the for the clients if you take away 10 10 percent 10 grand for for gst and then 25 percent for for your taxes well what, what have you got left you know so yeah. that's 65 you know, 35 35 out of the 100k left right obviously that's scalable all the way up and you have mm -hmm. as a business owner have to kind of work out well what kind of net profit do you actually want to take home to take on the risk of starting that business and a lot of yeah. business owners tend to kind of think that you know starting a business is, is the be all and end all and it's really cool to be an entrepreneur but the fact of the matter is mm -hmm. there's massive risk in it you know, yeah, they don't really see and if, if the returns aren't going to be there, why not just you know put your cash in some sort of some sort of um, maybe not a share portfolio now, but some sort of fixed fixed income, you yeah. know, just fund or, or something. Or, for example, for much less work, right? Go sit on the beach and earn ten percent, you know, similar amount of money. Um, that's to, to that point as well. You can run your business for so long at, at a cash flow neutral position, right? But what's building up behind the scenes are are those uh, tax debts, superannuation liabilities, which is always the first thing to go because, you know, super funds don't chase you to pay your employees super, right? Um, 
and then obviously the the director drawings as well right something that's that's going to hurt your business is you sucking your cash out of your business right um because of the lifestyle that you're living so yeah figuring out what your lifestyle choices are and what your business's capacity is to actually pay yourself is um probably another thing that or yeah another um something that business owners are self mindful about i suppose yeah 100 percent. now sort of uh taking a step back and, and just really kind of uh, focusing in on you mate tell, tell us a little bit a bit about your story mate how'd you get to where you are today my story gosh um Oh, Andrew, no personal questions, mate. I'm an accountant, so. <laughs> um, no, I mean, like, <laughs> uh, myself, mate. I'm um, oh, my. Oh, this is gonna sound. Um, I don't know how this is gonna sound, but my mate, my story is probably written in the stars. What I mean by that is, um, I'm born on the uh, I'm born on the end of the financial year, which is a very important date um, in our industry. So. Um, Mate, the, reckon the day I was born, I was just destined to, you know, be in this chair and do this podcast with you. <laughs> nice. um, so yeah, and then I don't know. I think I've been pretty lucky. I've um, I've known, I've, I've had an interest in accounting since um, since um, I, I suppose family friends and, and family members of mine have been working in the industry, and um, some of the best people I, some of the best people I know. Um, just really giving, giving people, personable people, um, intelligent people, and um, you know, and their their incomes weren't weren't small, I suppose. So looked at those looked at those few things, and um, yeah, looked at the the date of birth that I had, and then yep, yeah, we'll just give this a crack. So been um, been doing this now for about eight years. Fantastic, yeah. eight years and going strong, hey. And uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I remember you were telling me you're you're managing a fair few people now as well. So the career is going well, and obviously you've got your your new you got a, you got a son, right? Yeah, Leo. So he came he came to the party yeah about twelve months ago. Um, so he's very bright. He's very bright, young and um, very sprightly. I woke up at a like about like five a.m. this morning or something, which is nice. And um, and yeah, I think yeah, Walker Hill as a firm, we are. Um, I suppose yeah. Just, uh, I suppose kicking goals. We're um, we're growing faster now than than I suppose we have in the five years that I've been there. Um, being business, being in business for over ten years, um, I've been there for five. Um, yeah, I, I run a I run a team team now of um, four accountants um, and a client base of about one point two mil. And um, yeah, I think our our client base is something in something in the realm of like a thousand groups. Right. So a group could be um, a small business owner, obviously. Um, it could be just a mum and dad um, who have a couple of investment properties, or it could just be someone who's, um, I suppose, walked off the street, needs their needs their individual tax return done. However, obviously, that's not our target client. Much prefer to deal with those business owners. We have a lot more um, better conversations and, and a lot more fun. We can provide a lot more valuable advice with those types yeah. of clients. Yeah, hundred percent. Good stuff, mate. Well, well, thanks very much for your time. Really, really appreciate it. It's been great to sort of pick your brain about how to structure things, how to put your, your finances in order for the audience out there who are running their own businesses and don't have these things in order. Maybe it's time to have a chat to someone who can, who can kind of help you out, speed up the process, streamline your finances so that you can actually get to a stage where you're working on the business rather than in the business because strategy comes with being able to take a step back and look at it from a helicopter viewpoint right and this is what professionals tend to do for your businesses so so obviously my next question for you is where can we find you mate obviously what we'll do is we'll we'll put all of your details in the and in, in underneath this particular uh video here but yeah where, where can we find you yeah mate feel free to google um uh, just walker hill uh the walker hill group you'll come up um to a website where we do digital marketing finance brokering and accounting um so if you're on that website you're on the right one um uh, and then also, yeah, obviously, I suppose email and calling the office is probably the best way to get a hold of me. Um, but as I suppose, you know, it's just not just about me, um, you know, um, you know, picking up more clients or anything. It's just these these concepts are something that I suppose a lot of accountants know and, and should be um, explaining to um, you know to business owners, right? And I suppose nothing we've spoken about spoken about today. Except maybe the, suppose the structuring stuff is, is really technical at all, right? It's just all about um, 
uh, breaking down a couple of key concepts, putting in those you know the bank accounts, for example, into practice, and something like that is such a mindset change or helps the mindset of business owners to look at bank account, know what you owe. Um, and you know, we're not even talking about the technicalities of accounting and tax there, right? It's just something to take your mind off something else, focus on the business. Um, yeah. That's what you were talking about before. Yeah. I mean, I, I find a lot of business owners tend to kind of uh, decide, make, make their decisions based on fear, fear of the unknown, right? They talk, they talk, they try and get clarity. If they don't get clarity, they they feel fearful of making changes purely because of, well, they don't know what taxes they have to pay. They don't, they don't know what, what's coming at them. Therefore, they can't grow their businesses as fast. They can't build their portfolio as fast as they would like because of the, the fear of unknown, right? So yeah, by, or, by or, getting you know, it, as fast as they can actually do it, right? So 100%. You know, they've probably got the capability to do it. They just don't know how. Yeah, exactly. Good stuff, mate. Well, um, any parting thoughts before, before we wrap up today? So that's it, mate. Looking forward to podcast number two. Fantastic. Well, I'll, I'll keep you posted and maybe if baby number two comes, we'll, we'll definitely tee something up as well. <laughs> and if there's any changes, make sure you hit me up because I'd love to kind of bring you on regularly and, and, and talk about talk about some, some more of that stuff, kick the ball around and, and share some thoughts with the audience because there's a, lot of, a lot of the audience are looking to um, build their businesses build enterprise value so that they can reach financial freedom faster. If you like this particular podcast, if you've got any questions, make sure you hit me up in the in the comments below. I'll make sure to ask uh, Lachlan uh, from Walker Hill to give us more information if need be as well. We're here to help. My name is Andrew David Courtney. I thank you very much for your time. I look forward to seeing you on the next podcast. Thanks very much. Ciao.